And you know, I want to kind of set the stage a little bit for for uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, it was um, you know during the last legislative session, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion about uh, staffing, textile staffing, and you know, the, actually the, the the department had made a, a request to the appropriations uh, legislative appropriations request to the legislature for additional staffing, mostly for construction inspection, project manager, that, that, those types. And there was quite a bit of discussion at the legislature. And back in May of this year, when it looked like, okay, we're gonna get some, some level of uh, uh, additional staffing, uh, I got a call from, from Randy. And Randy Hopman asked uh, myself, Lonnie Gregorczyk, and Tracy Kane to uh, give him a recommended staffing plan for the whatever number of additional staff we would get from the legislature, which at the time it looked to be about you know half of what we had requested of uh, you know we had requested 627. It looked like it was going to be somewhere in the 313 and a half. I'm not sure who got that half, but we'll figure that one out. <laughs> so so Randy said, and I need this you know in a couple of weeks because as soon as the legislature uh, it's over, the session's over, we gotta get on, on, on the staffing plan and we gotta start hiring. So we had a pretty, pretty short fuse. So, you know, we looked at, um, okay, well, how, do we, how do we go about this uh, in a short time frame? We can't do a huge research project. So we got together and we, we, we knew that they had some, there was some previous uh, uh, workload staffing analysis that had been done in the, the previous couple of years. Um, one thing we also realized that um, anytime you look at staffing, especially construction staffing, um, that study that you're doing, that plan you're doing, it's really a snapshot in time. Where are you in terms of, you know, what the funding situation is like? Uh, you know, there's there's attrition through our, our staffing, you know, positions in, in the districts, and so um, these these documents get dated pretty quickly. So we have, but, but again, it gave us sort of a magnitude range of what we would be looking at. So we looked at those two, two studies that you see there. One was uh, done in, in August of 2015, kind of in uh, uh, advance of Prop 1 and 7, anticipating what those funds would do to us. And then the other one was done in early 2016 by McKinsey. Uh, again, looking at the, 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 the portfolio of projects and looking at what's a, what's a reasonable uh, split between textile and consultant work, and we were looking at somewhere in the 50-50 split. So those two analyses were done that gave us a little bit of a, uh, a go-by, if you will. Uh, here, here's just a quick, I'm not gonna spend time on this, but the total, this is the McKinsey staffing needs uh, based on, the, you see the lading there, about six billion uh, lading for, for uh, the, that period of years for the portfolio projects. So the total FTEs that would be needed were somewhere around 1,365 for a 50-50 split. But we knew we weren't gonna get there, so, so we had to, to play off of that. Okay, so we put together the list of tasks that we needed to do in a couple of weeks and uh, to, get, to get a report back to, to Randy and the administration. And um, you know, the, the, the primary task was, okay, let's determine the workload per district. Uh, that was going to be the driver. Uh, once we did that, then we had to develop okay, how, how do we turn that into staffing needs. Uh, compare that to the previous report to make sure we're not in left field anywhere. And then understanding that we would have to balance all of that out with the CNI program that we have. Uh, and then recommend a reasonable percentage uh, staffing with uh, those new uh, uh, FTEs. I guess we're supposed to say positions now. <laughs> uh, and so, so in order to do that, we, we wanted to take a broader look at not just construction inspectors, but record keepers, project managers, portfolio managers, contract specialists, and things like that. So uh, those are all the things that we, we set out to do in those couple of weeks. Um, all right, so, so this was the key right here, the, the, the workload analysis. Um, the good thing is we had a FY18 UTP that was in the process of being uh, finalized. So um, this is the logic that we kind of came up, came, came up with after a lot of uh, discussion and going back and forth and trying different things. So we looked at our 10-year target of, of, of planning target for every district from FY18 to FY27 for all the categories, 1 through 12. Now, and I'm going to show you a quick example. Of, we, we felt like the average, if you look at the 10-year average for categories 1 through 12, um, had some spikes in them. 
Now, some districts had some really uh, high years uh, that was caused spikes in those in that funding just due to maybe a large project that we, we all knew that those will probably be handled with CNI anyway. So what we did is we reduced the top two funding years and then average over eight years. So I'll show you what a couple of examples here. So we looked at three different types of districts to, to illustrate this example. Um, the Bowman district, their 10-year planning target was about you know, close to 900 million. Uh, but their top two years, 185 and 184, accounted for about 40% of their program. So if we were to use uh, a, a straight 10-year average, that would have been about 90 million a year versus the, by eliminating those two uh, top years and averaging over eight years, it was about 65 million a year. So it made a difference. And so then we looked at the uh, metro district, we looked at San Antonio, and uh, our, our uh, the, the San Antonio district at 2.6 billion a year, uh, took the top two years. It was actually uh, fairly steady, and that's what we saw with most of the metro districts. The funding fluctuations weren't there as as as, as high. They're a little bit more steady in the in their yearly uh, target. So you see how we came up with that uh, that number there. And then the Yokum district it was probably the extreme example in Yokum, where they had a 1.4 billion dollar program in it over the 10 years, uh, but their their top two years accounted for 50 percent of the program. So you don't staff for something like that. That's not, that's not reasonable. So again, we did the same exercise there, and there's about 88 million. So again, I think we came up with a reasonable uh, way to average that 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 uh, the UTP funding. Uh, we then added the MPO uh, funding because MPOs uh, separate they have their separate bank balance program. So we averaged that over 10 years. There weren't that many spikes. That was a more like I said, that was more bank bank balance type. Uh, and then uh, we took the bridge program and the, and the safety program, and basically did the same thing. Um, uh, the bridge program already had a 10-year program per district, so we used those numbers. And then the uh, safety program, we just basically made a decision to go uh, across the districts to 10 million a year. We normalized that. So then we came up with this, what we call the baseline uh, annual letting per district. And, and this was the key, because this was gonna be our basis for the staffing computations. Um, and again, uh, it doesn't account for every project. It, it doesn't account for those, uh, those, uh, those peaks, those, those large projects, which would have to be C and I anyway. So we all understood that there's still gonna have to be a need for C and I uh, projects. Then the, the next part of, the extra, of this, this work was, all right, now that we have the, this baseline letting per, per district per year, how do we then calculate the staffing needs to manage that workload? And, and so we started looking at some of the, the, the metrics that have been developed. To go, again, we weren't in a, in a position to develop any new, new systems. So we worked with uh, what had already been developed in the past with, uh, by CTR. They did some work for the Fourth Wood District, uh, which consisted of payouts per, per inspector per month. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we projected the UTP workload, so we de de determined that baseline lading. Um, and then we needed, this is the key, we needed a methodology, because we, we didn't have the time to take that 10-year program for every district and, and put it, uh, roll it out and calculate inspect, uh, payouts per inspector per month. So we, we had, luckily, uh, we had had a group of uh, TechStot uh, leaders that worked with uh, CST, that came up with a, um, um, a methodology that would correlate lettings per year with an average uh, monthly payouts. Uh, that was the key. So we, 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 uh, we checked that. We went in and, and, and logic checked that, uh, that methodology uh, for a specific district uh, by g going through all of their projects and actually laying out a, 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 uh, a payout per inspector per month, and, and it, it checked out pretty close. So we, for, we were comfortable with that, that methodology that, that was put together through a national leadership team uh, by TechStop was gonna be, was gonna work for us. Um, so then we, we identified, again, finding that delta in staffing. That was gonna be a snapshot in time. Again, this was gonna be just as we stood at that time. Um, and then, uh, arriving, and the, the last part of this was we had to arrive at a reasonable staffing level because, again, we weren't going to get every position that we, that we were going to be short. That gap was going to be greater than what we were getting. So we had to identify what's a reasonable staffing level 
sort of like the pain level, nor normalize the pain level, if you, if you will. And so we kind of came up with a, the thought that the metro districts, if we can staff them to about 50% of the, the baseline letting, they'll use CAI for, CNI for the rest. Uh, most metro districts are doing that already. The urban and rural uh, uh, areas, we would want them at a higher staffing level because we, we want them to use less CNI, just that those projects don't, don't lend themselves to as well. So we wanted to get to a, try to get to an 80% um, staffing level at the urban and rural. They will still have some CNI work for, for some of the larger projects. So that was our, our target. Uh, I don't know, you probably can't read this very well, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So essentially what we did is we came up with the baseline needs inspector needs per district, which happened to be about 1,500 and, and change. So very close to the previous studies that have been done. We, and I'll give credit to Gina Gallegos, who I kept bothering uh, throughout this whole process, and she was my conduit to all the districts and all of the directors of construction and getting some feedback on, okay, what is our current staffing level at the time? Uh, and this, you can just run an HR report, we tried that, but job titles, you all know how that goes, uh, that just doesn't work. So, so we had Gina really coordinating very closely with every director of construction from the state, getting that, what is our current uh, staffing at, the, at, at, at that point in time. And then identifying well, what, what jobs or what positions are open to be filled that we have vacancies for. And then that gave us that gap. And so that, that's the 581, which again, checked up pretty close with the uh, statewide uh, efforts, uh, staffing levels that have been done before. And in the last column is our, the current staffing capacity that we were talking about. And you can see that some districts actually showed that they have plenty of uh, construction staffing for that baseline letting that we were talking about. Remember, we were talking about that baseline letting. Uh, and others were really, really short. So again, the pain level was all, all over the place. So our effort was let's try to normalize the, the pain level, like I mentioned. So these are the, 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 the total numbers. Uh, uh, the baseline letting doesn't include every major project. We talked about how we, we came up with that. And then our, our inspection needs. Now knowing we weren't gonna get 581 inspectors, we had to figure out a way to, to normalize that. So here's an example of the same three districts. And the reason I'm using three districts here, these two same three, it's uh, Tucker and Paul Wright. For, we brought them into our group to help us out to get the, the urban and the, and the rural perspective. But you can see the current staffing capacity for the, those three districts right there. Uh, Beaumont actually was in pretty good shape uh, staffing-wise. So, you know, when, you, when we applied the 80% the rule to them, they, they didn't get any additional FTEs or positions. Uh, San Antonio was at 41%, so when we applied the 50% metro rule, we, we came up with 12 for us. Uh, and then Yoakum was at 41%, even with taking those big projects out of their, their equation. So they, to get them to 80%, they needed 17 additional FTEs. That's how we worked this, this normalizing the, 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 the pain level. And then the last thing we did, uh, since we, we were authorized 313 uh, additional employees, we went ahead and applied those metrics, uh, that methodology that I just explained to you. And we gave a recommendation to the, the administration for uh, numbers of construction inspectors, project managers, portfolio managers, contract specialists, construction record keepers, and utility coordinators. And so those metrics uh, were the drivers for, again, for, for all of these. Uh, and then the final allocations were, were distributed out by, by our administration to every district. And you can see, it may be hard to see there, but anyway, every district received a certain allocation based on those metrics that I just re reviewed. Again, it was an effort to look at our needs at the time. Um, I think we made some good decisions. I think we normalized the pain level. We did, throughout this whole process, we cross-checked with a lot of the, the district engineers. Uh, Lonnie, myself, would be calling the DEs to figure out that, does this make sense? Is, is this logic right? Are, are, you, are you hurting really bad in construction? Or, 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 you know, Houston, for example, showed there were 180 FTEs uh, uh, low. Well, uh, when we called, uh, you know, Quincy, we talked to Quincy, and he was up front and says, look, we can make up with CI. You know, we're okay. We can manage it with the, our CI program is strong. Uh, and so we did a lot of that back and forth with a lot of the DEs to make sure that we weren't, again, putting someone in a bind. And uh, the numbers, I think, again, I think everyone would love to have more FTEs, 
or more employees. Uh, but as it stands today, our challenge is to hire up to these numbers because we're nowhere near these. So I think all of us are hiring and hiring fast and probably not fast enough, but we'll continue. So that's how we kind of went through this exercise and, and, and provided, I think, a reasonable recommendation to our administration to, to make some decisions on how to distribute the, these allocations. And, and again, I'm sure as things go uh, in the future, uh, you know, we'll, we'll reevaluate this, you know, probably every couple of years anyway. So uh, that's all I have. Any questions? I'll be glad to answer them. I know everybody wants to get out of here, but okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate you. <laughs>